And uh, welcome to Land of Medicine Buddha, whether you're here or you are in your house. And we'll start with setting our motivation and um, doing the prayer of the six perfections just to get us into the right headspace. So um, join if you feel comfortable and familiar. Sangge chudam sogi chunam nai janju padu dane kapsuchi dagi jin sogi pe sonam ki rola penche sangge drupa shom sangge chudam sogi chunam la janju padu dane kapsuchi Dagi jin sogi pe sonam ki rola penje sangge drupa sho sangge churam sogi chunam la janchu paru dane kapsuchi dagi jin sogi pe sonam ki rola penje sangge drupa sho we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching for enhancing the mind that gives without attachment, namely transforming our bodies, wealth, and collection of virtue over the three times into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of moral discipline, working for the sake of sentient beings enacting virtuous deeds and not transgressing the bounds of the Pratamoksha, Bodhisattva, and Tantric vows, even at the cost of our lives. Should even the myriad beings of the three realms without exception become angry at us, humiliate, criticize, threaten, or even kill us, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of patience not to be distraught, but to work for their benefit in response to their harm. Even if we must remain for an ocean of eons in the fiery hells of Avicii for the sake of one sentient being alone, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of joyous effort, to strive with compassion for supreme enlightenment and not to be discouraged. Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration through the samadhi of single-pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how all external phenomena lack true existence yet still appear, like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. Samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. And so we just sit with that motivation. And then we just revive very briefly our understanding of what a perfection is, a paramita. It means reaching for perfection or Buddhahood. Our reason for practicing these perfections is to work towards our enlightenment via these practices with the motivation to benefit all, including ourselves. This is our bodhicitta motivation. Okay. So we're up to patience and uh, we started patience last week, just kind of understanding the nature of this like forbearance with suffering or forbearance with harmfulness. And the first thing we look at is Lama Tsongkhapa's explanation because we really need to rely on valid sources when we're unpacking the Buddhist view of things. And then you can decide for yourself whether you agree or disagree. So practicing patience from Lama Tsongkhapa's perspective, and he's drawing of course on the works of the Buddha himself, means that you simply complete your conditioning to a state of mind where you have stopped your anger and the like. So it's really important that we start with what is anger. 
because from a Buddhist perspective, anger is the wish to harm. So the wish to harm is what we're trying to stop. So when you hear anger, think wish to harm in this context, because later we're going to start talking about how anger is unjustified. And then you'll get all kind of indignant and think, yes, but what about righteous anger? And then there'll be a whole thing. Remember, <laughs> we're talking about the wish to harm, not simply being upset. Okay. And what does it mean to stop anger? Because stopping anger can have all sorts of unfortunate connotations or kind of, you know, um, there's different viewpoints on whether or not that's a good idea and what it could lead to. So stopping anger means not to respond to your suffering with retaliatory intention to harm. So when you have suffering, whatever the cause, whether you think it's a person, whether you think it's a situation, whatever you think is giving you the problem, your response isn't, therefore I'm gonna lash out. So that's what we mean by stopping anger. Um, what does it mean to stop anger? It also means not to feed it with belief, justification when it arises, not to suppress it or deny its presence in your mind. So this means that you're remembering that the specific observations you have when you're angry can be correct, but the specific response of anger is more optional than we allow. So when you're angry, you might notice things that are true, but then your conclusion is, therefore, the source must be punished, and that's what's problematic. Um, not to suppress or deny its presence in your mind means you're not pretending you aren't angry just because you know anger is bad. You're not sort of jumping over the fact that it's here. You're turning towards the disadvantage of anger itself. Yeah, so rather than trying to justify the story of why, you say, I'll come back to why I'm angry later when I settle down. Right now, I'm just going to look at anger itself and how it agitates my mind, how it disturbs my peace, and all of the ways that it's causing me trouble over time. And we looked at this quote last week from Master Shanti Deva, which kind of summarizes all this. So just to repeat Shantideva's verses, he says, unruly beings are as unlimited as space. They cannot possibly all be overcome. But if I overcome thoughts of anger alone, this will be equivalent to vanquishing all foes. Where would I possibly find enough leather with which to cover the surface of the earth? But wearing leather just on the soles of my shoes is equivalent to covering the earth with it. Likewise, it is not possible for me to restrain the external course of things, but should I restrain this mind of mine, what would be the need to restrain all else? Okay. So that's the review from last week. And I'm just curious now that you've had some time to sit with it. And those of you that are um, new to this, these classes, now that you've kind of had a look at what we've been talking about, what feels really helpful and what feels potentially problematic when you're thinking about stopping anger? Yeah, when you're thinking of generating patience, are there pitfalls that you've already seen in your life and not quite getting what's the way to manage anger? Hi, Venerable. Okay, so thank you for last week the explanation of what anger is in the Buddhist definition. For myself, that really switched on a light bulb. I felt like I was able to observe it in myself much more clearly. And as uncomfortable as that was, especially in terms of like all the little ways that we're like, well, I'm not going to say hi, you know, or yeah. I'm not going to acknowledge that person. You know, it's just like I saw that in myself. And <clears throat> as uncomfortable as that was, if I, when I allowed myself to really be honest with myself, I was able to observe it in others as well. Mm -hmm. And it really helped me not respond in a way that was inauthentic. If I felt hurt, even minorly, I was like, well, that's why, because there's some anger there. You know, it's, I'm not like overreacting or being too mm -hmm. sensitive. But then it also prevented me, so it prevented me from responding in a way that was actually really not healthy for myself to 
not acknowledge it or to try to appease or something like that just habitually. Yeah. Um, and so I had a lot more peace in my life. That's for sure. Oh, good. And, yeah. And continue, continue to work with it, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. But I'm, I'm glad it's resonating. And I think you're pointing to something really important about the way to approach study, which is the more you develop self-awareness, the easier it is to have compassion for others. Yeah. And so, you know, of course, yes. have compassion for yourself, see your own stuff. But it is very much how you describe that you see the way you're angry much more easily when you're suffering, when you're tired, when you're hungry, when this, when that, when this, when that. And the more you develop an understanding of your own triggers, the more patient you are when other people are having problematic responses. Because you think, yeah, I get that. <laughs> I get that. I might not agree with your response. I might not like what you're doing, but I understand why. It might look different from me because I have different conditioning and socialization and background, but I get why, you know, and so your heart is softened and there's some sort of affinity. There's some sort of pathway of empathy there and you don't feel so alienated by people who are badly behaved <laughs> because you know why you're badly behaved. So that self-awareness reinforces compassion for others. And it's a really nice feedback loop that can happen unless your self-awareness is too tightly attached to what you see and too identified with what you see, in which case you can get defensive. Your self-awareness will make you more fragile because you're embarrassed about what you found and you hope no one else finds out. So whenever you're doing these practices that are developing self-awareness and understanding your triggers for things, remember again and again that negative states of mind are additional to your mind. They don't enter into the very essence of it. They're habitual patterns. They're symptoms of suffering, symptoms of ignorance. They are not you. They are changeable. So when you, then you can really aggressively say, this needs to get out instead of it feeling like some sort of self-harming action of like cutting pieces off of your own identity. You just think, oh, that's a problematic behavior, which made sense at the time and moving on, you know, and it's not quite so loaded. Yeah, um, John, go ahead. I was gonna say, uh, one thing I struggled with was just showing patience toward myself. Um, yeah. yeah, that was just something that came up for me this past week, so. Were you expecting progress to be quicker or where were you losing patience for yourself, do you think? Progress to be quicker, definitely. Um, and not really valuing. I think that what I reflected on was just, I didn't really value what patience was or like what it is I'm trying to achieve. And I think what I realized was I want to create a space for me to grow, if that makes sense. Mm. And yeah, that was sort of my takeaway. Yeah, yeah. And it is a little cringy that you you know better so much earlier than you do better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you know that is true of all things, isn't it? You've learned the lesson a million times before you actually change your responses, and that doesn't need to be so frustrating if you know that's kind of built into the way we learn. Then the expectations aren't too high, you know, and then you don't get that frustration with yourself. You're like, okay, I know better now, but I'm not going to do any better for ages. <laughs> Yeah. And just assume that because it's true, isn't it? Just assume that. And then you're a little bit more gentle when you see you're not living up to your own ideals. Yeah. So really, really gently. Um, so much progress is just built on repetition of wisdom, remembering your wisdom on purpose, bringing your own lessons back to yourself and reinforcing them. And a lot of the reflection, the wisdom of reflection that we do prior to meditation is making yourself remember what you already know. Rather than just kind of letting life teach you the same lesson again and again, you know, whether you decide to learn it or not, you know, whether you decide it's a lesson or not, instead of waiting for the next time you're angry to see if you can work on anger, you're sitting with all the times you've been angry earlier and seeing if you can work on some of those patterns now and then preemptive strike. Yeah, so your mind is trainable, don't worry. It's trainable, it just needs repetition. And it needs a lot of angles to come back to a simple truth. So sometimes when you're listening to things from Buddhism, for example, it sounds like common sense, it sounds like basic psychology, it sounds obvious, you've known it your whole adult life, maybe even in childhood, and yet, 
is still not quite practicing it. And what will happen is that through Buddhism, particularly in our tradition, there are lists and lists and lists. And there's all this elaboration and all of this detail and reasons why. And then you wind back up at the same simple premise that you started with, but now it goes deeper and now it's more integrated. So if you just kept hammering yourself with the simple truth, it might have the power and the ingredients to kind of get digested. But by coming at it from a million different angles, you can return to the simple truth like compassion's a good idea, <laughs> which you already believed, but it has more power to sink in. So don't get lost in the elaboration. The elaboration will lead you back to the simple things you already know, but lead you deeper into them. So we're gonna really get into the Lamrim, um, the stages of the path, and really look at um, the perfection of patience section because the outlines there are very profound and the logic there is really fun to play with because we're really looking at how we justify our anger and convince ourselves this is the only response possible. And it's almost like Lama Tsongkhapa is teasing us a little bit and saying, oh, you think that's a good reason to be angry? Yeah, I'm gonna prove that you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, but he's, it's playing with us because it's with this like joy of learning about the human condition and how we're all equally absurd. We're all full of hypocrisy. And actually that's a great relief because you don't feel like you're the weird one that doesn't get it. We're all like that, yeah. So, so we're gonna do a little bit of a deep dive into the outlines um, and you don't have to remember any of these. This is just food for thought, okay? So there's three types of patients. Patients when we are harmed by others, patients when we are suffering, patients of keeping concentration. And we're still just looking at patients when harmed by others. So forbearance with people. We're just looking at humans still, okay? We'll look at other things later, and that's a fun conversation too, but we're just at patients when we're harmed by others. So there's a whole long section, and you don't have to read all of this, but just know that it exists. The big heading is showing that anger is unjustified, <laughs> okay? That's the big heading, many subheadings, okay? So the first analysis is on analysis of the object, anger is unjustified. Then on analysis of the subject, anger is unjustified. Then on analysis of the basis, anger is unjustified. And then you land at compassion is appropriate. All of which you already know, but you're gonna hit it from a lot of angles, which is gonna kind of like laugh you out of your bad habits. Yeah. So the first one we're looking at is analysis of the object. Okay, so what is anger? Anger is the wish to harm. What is the object? The object is what we're blaming. Yeah, what are we blaming our suffering on? What, where do we think the suffering's coming from? So here we're just specifically looking at when we're quite certain it's something outside of ourself that is giving us pain, particularly a person's actions or inaction. Yeah. So First, we look at the point whether the object has self-control, anger is unjustified. Because this is a really key piece of where we justify our anger. We think the person has complete control over what they're doing, how dare they? <laughs> or the person is totally out of control, they're such a mess, how dare they? So we can use opposite reasons to come to the same conclusion. Issues around whether they have control or not feeds a lot of our sense of justifiable anger. Do you agree, generally speaking? And the conclusion that we're gonna to come to, you know, the spoiler alert is whether they do have control or they don't have control, the wish to harm is not logical. You know, spoiler alert, right? In either case, it's not. Even if it's understandable, even if it's habitual, whether they have control or not, anger is not justified. But just kind of sit with that a little bit and ask yourself, is that where a lot of my anger gets fueled from? You know, if you're thinking about a conflict with a person in your life, is there some element that is really resenting something around control issues? Is that one of the ones that comes up? Control issues. They knew all the things, they had all the power and they did it anyway, how dare they? Yeah. 
or they're a complete loose cannon, they're totally out of control, and how dare they? One of the two that comes up. Um, do you have a favorite? <laughs> You're more likely to be annoyed with people if they seem to have control, or are you more likely to be annoyed with people when they don't seem to have control? Just, you know, there's not like a right or wrong, right? But just like, think about it. No control, total control. Or what makes you let people off the hook? Yeah, like, oh, they didn't know any better. Oh, well, they knew better. <laughs> I don't know which one. Right. And it doesn't even really matter. It's, it's just an exercise of self knowing of what is my ammunition to keep my heart hardened. Yeah, yeah, Janine. I have to admit that that is my mother is has this she, she just she's always like stream of consciousness talking about things in this very unfocused way and it drives me nuts <laughs> and i do find myself sadly responding in a very um not very patient way because you're like uh don't you know what you're doing or how can you not know what you're doing or like what's the voice in your the back of your ma mind that says unacceptable mom it's unacceptable like, can you learn? <laughs> yeah can't you learn yeah can't you learn don't you know better yes, yes. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yep, yeah, and that's a classic example, isn't it, of um, uh, we take something that we assume is an inherent truth, like polite conversation goes this way. How dare you not ad adhere to societal standards of a polite conversation? Yeah, particularly because didn't you teach me them? You're my mom, <laughs> right? right? And so, you know, we use all of this ammunition to say, therefore, my rage is natural and necessary or my impatience or my annoyance, because it's a spectrum, isn't it? And, and if you can kind of get a handle on how the seeds or the fuel for your just a little tiny creeping annoyance of just kind of like bit tense, wish it would finish, is on a spectrum to boiling rage. Yeah, it's like, if you don't nip it in the bud there, it'll keep escalating until the 20th time that week. You're like, mom, I'm not talking to you all next month. Click, you know? And this, this is the thing with catching our anger is you can catch just anger itself, the feeling of it and say, anger does not help whatever the content or reason. Anger itself is like that cliche of drinking poison and expecting the other person to die right? Like it does not help facilitate the healing or the happiness. You know that. But what you can also do is try and preempt it with going through and unpacking your false logic. And this is what we're going to do. We have to unpack our false logic so that we can't use the same ammunition next time. Because do you find anger has a lot to say? There's a lot of words in our anger. Proofs of why it should stay. And if those words start up, but you've already countered them, they're kind of embarrassed and they're like, mm, never mind. <laughs> I'm still mad though. <laughs> you know, but the like still mad though feeling has less gas. You know, and it just kind of goes, all right. <laughs> yeah, and it, it really rolls through much quicker. But while your words feel true, your wor words will be fuel for your anger. So when you're not angry, counter them. Yeah, okay, so when you're not angry, you counter them, so unpacking that, all right. So here's where we're going to, is whether they have control or not, harm is not logical, the wish to harm is not logical, anger is not logical. So how do we get there? And this is straight from the Lam Rim Chenmo, I'm just gonna read it out to you. Um, Lama Tsongkhapa says, analyze, thinking, what would be, reasonable grounds for anger towards quote harm doers what would be reasonable grounds and then you think they first had the thought of wanting to harm me prepared the method and then either prevented my happiness or inflicted unpleasant physical or mental suffering so my anger is justified that's what you say to yourself right they either prevented my happiness or they gave me physical or mental pain therefore my anger makes sense Therefore, it's allowed. Therefore, it's only right. So then you ask, 
Are you angry because they inflicted harm while they had the self-control not to harm you? Or are you angry because they were utterly without any self-control and hurt you while helplessly impelled by something else? And then they're like, guess what? <laughs> so then in the former case, your anger is unjustified because those who inflict harm do not have control over themselves. For when the causes and conditions, seeds left by afflictions to which they were previously habituated, a nearby object, an erroneous conception, come together, they give rise to the thought harm. Even though the harm doers do not think, I will feel malice. You know, they're not like thinking, now I feel malice, right? But the causes and conditions, if those causes and conditions are not complete, they will never produce the thought to harm. Yeah, so they have many causes and conditions coming together for them to have this abrasive behavior, whatever it is. So these causes and conditions produce the desire to harm. This in turn produces the work of harming and this produces suffering for someone else. So those harm doers do not have even the slightest self-control and you're like, mm? moreover, they become like servants of their afflictions because they are under the control of others, i.e. their afflictions. So this former case, anger is unjustified because those who inflict harm do not have control over themselves. The immediate kind of grumble you'll have is, sure they do. Yeah, sure they do. But if they did, would they do that? Like how often do you as an individual plot to ruin someone's happiness? You know, are you sitting at home, like, I don't know, scrolling through your phone, listening to music, having a snack, and then you stop and you think, now is the time of day when I like to plot the destruction of others' happiness. You know, like, are you like Mr. Burns from The Simpsons? And you're like, ha, 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 you know, you're not plotting, yeah? Do you think other people are plotting with that so specific? They might be plotting activities that will wind up harming others, but do you think that their main goal is to harm them? Their main goal is to get their own happiness. Their main goal is to relieve their own suffering or to do that for their loved ones or people they consider them. There is very few humans on this earth who are so habituated to negativity that their thoughts are genuinely, I wanna hurt everybody and my plots and my plans and my strategies and ambitions are about wanting to hurt. But even if that were the case, it would be driven by so much ignorance so they're controlled by ignorance and driven by so much afflictions uh, all, besides ignorance, you know, anger, attachment, pride, jealousy, yeah, being controlled by those and often just controlled by suffering. Yeah, the suffering of feeling deprivation or the fear of losing something. So what is controlling them? Yeah, and just to think there are a lot of things controlling all of us at all times. Yeah, a lot of things. And when we quote, choose to lash out, we make no choice alone. Yeah, the time of day, the weather, what we've eaten, our conditioning, who is there, what their karma is, millions of things came together for an event. And for us to even call it an event, because there might be a day where you feel like you had a lot of conflict with someone and it didn't even register to them as conflict. That was just a normal conversation for them. So even to frame it as harmful, countless causes and conditions. So, so we're just thinking about these things from a lot of different angles. Where is the harm coming from? What is making me call it harm? Lots of things, okay? So then we'll look at the other side which is in the latter case, you are angry because the harm doers are utterly without self-control and being helplessly impelled by something else, they hurt you. When bodhisattvas are hurt by others, they think. They do this because the demons of the afflictions have eliminated their ability to control themselves. Without being even the slightest bit angry with those persons, they then generate the spirit of enlightenment thinking, I will strive at the bodhisattva deeds in order to free them from these afflictions. So rather than punishing them for their afflictions or punishing them for their suffering, you're going to the cause of the afflictions and the suffering and wanting to uproot those. 
So the very bad behavior itself triggers compassion. The very bad behavior itself motivates bodhisattvas to continue on their path because they see at their level right now, our ability to help is limited. But if we had a clearer mind and a more open heart, we would be less reactive and a lot more beneficial. So they see problematic people and they're not letting them off the hook thinking, you know, sure, do what you want. It's not the same thing as some sort of complacency. Yeah, it's not complacency. And that's, I think, where we get stuck is we think, if I'm so forgiving, if I'm so patient, that means what they did was okay. What they did doesn't have to be okay. It could be completely not okay. You could, so much not okay that you even take them to court, not okay. But you're taking them to court out of what reason? To prevent them from harming others, not to punish them for suffering, for afflictions. So if what they did, they are not likely to repeat, you don't need to take them to court, do you? Because that would just be to punish them. If what they did, they are likely to repeat, you might need to do actions to protect them from others and to protect them from their own negative karma. But this is the way we want to start looking at things. It's a lot more big picture. It's a lot more seeing that all sentient beings are connected. They're connected biologically. We all know that we're interdependent, but we're also connected in the same way as our hands are connected to the same body as our feet. So if your hand is diseased, your feet aren't mad at your hand. They're compensating for it. Your toes might have to learn how to write or something, but it's not like you're mad at the diseased portion. You're trying to think, how can I make it better? using the health of the rest of my body. And this is the way we want to think of problematic people. How can we increase their health or prevent the disease from spreading? Yeah, Andrea, what do you think? My question comes from kind of looking at the bigger picture. It seems like one element of what we're discussing about looking at this logic is letting go of for myself, like what I think should be or what I think is right. And then comparing what I'm observing to that. And instead, like, okay, this is what acknowledging, maybe this is what I think should be happening, but really being more in the present moment in trying to just experience what I'm observing and then going from there. Does that sound true? Yeah. Yeah. Give yourself a minute to check what you've decided it all means because then you have more options in your response. Yeah. Okay, so not yeah. being reactive, right? Yeah, exactly. Re like responsive, not reactive, right? Something groovy like that. There's some sort of excellent framing we could come up with. But you know, the, the point is you don't want the animal instinct. You don't want the lizard bra brain. You don't want a trauma response. And all of those responses are completely natural, completely forgivable, deserve, deserve tons of compassion and kindness. However, we can evolve through them to something bigger and more holistic. And doing that in the heat of the moment is really hard work. So build your strength when things aren't as stressful. Prepare yourself for problematic people because they will come. You know they will. Yeah, they will come. And maybe you will be your own problematic person if you're alone in the cave, right? You can't escape them. Even if you go to the cave, you'll be your own problem. Yeah. <laughs> you and your mind will just have a war. And, you know, trust me, it happens. So, so you're just sort of sitting with, what is my end goal here? My end goal is a peaceful society. Yeah, a non-harmful society. Can I get everyone to agree on everything? No. No, but is that actually necessary for a harmonious society? There's plenty of things we can disagree on and still have harmony. There's a few key things we might need to come to some agreement on, for sure. But generally speaking, finding peace with, I guess, just kind of conventional disagreements is a really important skill set on the spiritual path. And we're so used to thinking we can only have peace once there's agreement. It's, it's a much bigger heart that can say, that actually is not a criteria for my patients. We can agree or not, and I can maintain patience and from there increase love, et cetera. Yeah, but yeah, Charity, what did you 
think. I was suddenly struck and I'm still struck by the realization that I'm a more active participant in wishing harm for a particular person that has caused me harm. Um, for a while I've said, well, I only wish the same pain on him that I have experienced from him. Isn't that only fair? Yeah. And, um, and the thing is, uh, I'm, <laughs> wow. I'm struck with the fact that uh, ideally, I do have this idea that the human race is all one and we are connected. Um, <laughs> but then when it comes to this one person who is the only person in my life that I have wished harm on, I'm, I'm, I'm struck with the fact that, and I cannot, you know, examine the threads now, but I can already think of moments where, um, and thankfully I don't have to interact with him anymore, but where I really was just wishing him harm. And it has, it has, it has changed, you know, my brain. And yeah. In order to prevent that happening again, um, you know, obviously I've learned a lot about relationships and who to avoid, but it really is vital that I do not view him as the one exception. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm struck <laughs> right now. Yeah, so, yeah, I'll be yeah. nice to everyone except Hitler, or I'll be nice to everyone except for the big abuser or the big whoever. And generally, I'm a very nice person except for you you're going to cop it. But I think there's something really important to examine about your own wisdom in the afflictive response. And of course, afflictions and wisdom can't abide at the same exact time. Yeah, because they're opposites. But sometimes you want someone to feel the pain that you felt, because part of you wants them to have empathy. If they felt the pain that you felt, maybe they'd stop doing that. And, some, and then part of you wants them to feel the pain that you felt because you're mad and you want to punish them. So there could be two reasons for you wanting to, them to feel the pain. And one of them could be actually, if they only knew the harm they were doing, they would stop. And so, you know, treasure the wisdom within there that, can ha that sparks in amongst the chaos and the afflictions of, you know, you really consciously saw this is a problematic behavior. And for some people, when they experience trauma, their natural response is, I will always protect people from feeling this way. I will always prevent this harmful action in myself and others. And some people's response to trauma is, I cannot process why this is a good thing to do. So I'm going to keep repeating it until it makes sense to me, or it's the only thing that does make sense to me. And I'm going to harm people the way they harmed me, because that's the way my wiring says is normal. So there's two responses to the same kinds of trauma, isn't there? And there can be those two kind of responses within us as well that take turns of, I wanna hurt them the way they hurt me, or I wanna hurt others the way I was hurt because it feels normal, it feels natural, it feels necessary, or this was so horrible, I must prevent it at all costs. And they both have countless causes and conditions. It's not like one is like from an innately good person who has an innately good soul and heart primordially, and one is an innately bad and evil person. They were born that way and the conditions ripened it. No, we are not so black and white. From a Buddhist perspective, our consciousnesses have existed from beginningless time together with their innate ignorance, which means we have been the perpetrator and we have been the victim and the perpetrator and the victim and the perpetrator and the victim and again and again and again and again. We have been the, the, the dictator that, you know, raped and pillaged and was the horrible soldier. And then we've been the, the people that were subordinate or trodden over or dominated countless times, which is one of the millions of reasons why we want to stop responding with anger. Because even though anger can work to dominate a difficult person, it's very short lived. You can win with angry responses, quote, win. You can get them to stop what they're doing. But then the backlash, usually even in the same lifetime, but even if it's not in the same lifetime, then the future lifetime. So then the cycle of violence continues and continues. And so much of our problems in society are needing someone to say, I was the one that was wrong. You were the one who was right. And nothing has ever been that clean. 
And you don't even need to be Buddhist to know that. You just need to read history. And it could be, okay, I received the most recent harm. So I have the freshest blood. So I need the closest care. But you'll scab over and forget about it and then be the perpetrator again if you don't control your mind. Yeah. And we want to think that bad people are a special case, but they just have special conditions. So if we're thinking we're dramatically different to them, that's also a problem. So there's a lot of ways to, to navigate this, but I think what I'm trying to say to you, Charity, is that your response is completely normal and natural, and there's nothing wrong with you. And you're going deeper and deeper into the reasons why, but there might've even been reasons at the time that had glimmers of wisdom in them, which was, if you felt what I felt, you wouldn't do such things. I'm guessing that was in there too, even amongst the, you're the special no, case. You're, yeah. you're right. And I, I appreciate that redirect. Um, I have a tendency of being way too hard on myself. Um, and that's a really excellent point um, because I have often wished she just understood, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Ladan, what do you think? This is like a, a vicious circle because um, I, I, when I'm, I'm trying to uh, understand the anger. Uh, I know that is harmful. I know that is harmful for everybody. But sometimes when it comes and people are not acting the way they should, in my opinion, um, I, I tell to myself maybe I uh, I did the same. So kind of guilt and. Um, not having the choice come to my mind. Like each time I think um, somebody does something uh, bad to me or make me angry, or um, I say to myself that uh, this is my own karma you. that I created it. And so, then you take it too far and get guilty and identify with it. And you and know then, that's not yeah, And then I just, I don't know if it's uh, because suppressing the anger is not good. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel that it's like, I don't know how to deal with it. And I just say, whatever. And I can't um, <laughs> cope with the anger, but I suppress it somehow. And yeah. guilt come. Yeah. Um, so cut it out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> like, it's just that simple, right? It's not so simple. But these, these logics, right? This is your life. Don't, don't separate these lists from your life. This is your life. Um, and remember that in Buddhism, there is no guilt. There is regret, which is just see a fault to be a fault. But don't attribute sentience to karma the only sentience in karma is your own sentience, okay? There's no external father figure punishing you or rewarding you. And karma is not fate. Karma, karma no. is just cause and effect, right? Just cause and effect. And yeah. so if you don't like the effect, you work on the things that cause it so you don't have that anymore. For, and for then, future. Like, exactly right? for future but you don't have to like identify so much with it like oh therefore i'm bad like we've all been bad like like it's not you it made sense at the time you were a magic philanthropist who gave thousands of dollars to wonderful charities you were a horrible dictator that burned down villages you were you know a sadistic this you were a kind and beneficial that who cares right like now what are you going to do with the habits in your mind let, let on so the bad things okay. happen or the suffering happens, I want you to stop identifying with it, okay? You're not being punished and you're not being told that you're bad. It's just a seed got watered. And so if you don't like the sprout, stop watering it. That means change the conditions in your mind, change the way you frame things. And then the seed itself, look at how can I stop creating cause for those seeds? Everything's of a similar type. So if people are yelling at me and I don't like people yelling at me, I'll stop yelling, <laughs> you know, yelling out of anger. I'll stop that. So I'm not planting any more seeds. And then when people keep doing it, I know that I have old seeds that have not yet fruited. I can purify some, burn them up, but I can also change the way I view this behavior that feels like a weapon. 
because if someone else did it or it happened in a different context, it wouldn't feel this way. We've given the action too much power to punish us. So a lot of this is reframing the way we hear things because we hear things as necessarily, this is what hurts me, but it's not the only reason you feel hurt. There's a million reasons and you've just isolated one tiny piece and said that was the wound giver. Yeah, so just really gently. Um, we're gonna go through a couple more points and then I'll, I'll circle Thank back you to very you. Much. Yeah, yeah, no, and keep sitting with it. I just don't want you to beat yourself up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's not how we roll, okay. right? We're Buddhist. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so back to it a little bit more and then we'll, we'll flesh it out. But, you know, the conclusion here is whether they have control or not, the wish to harm is not logical. Many things control a person. No action is ever done from one condition only. So why are we angry specifically at one condition? We think the person is the cause of the suffering. They are one of countless conditions to water our karmic seeds. Yeah. One of countless conditions. And that but we're just, you know, we could just as logically say the red shirt that they wore that made them feel kind of spicy is why <laughs> they said that mean thing. I hate their red shirt. The red shirt should be punished. Like who knows why people do what they do. Yeah, a million reasons. You know, you can think actually the way they said it just like that is from the socialization of their family and the way that arguments happened in their family, which is so similar to my own family, which is why it landed. And if I'd been brought up differently or if they had been brought up differently, this whole event would feel differently. There's nothing from the side of these specific words or that specific person that gave me this feeling. It was a combination of things, yet I'm only blaming one thing. It's not rational. And does picking one thing ease the suffering, <laughs> right? You pick one thing to blame, does it make it feel better? For a minute, maybe, yeah. You are why, maybe, maybe not. Um, so, I mean, the next one I think is quite interesting. It's called on analysis of either adventitiousness or inherency, anger is unjustified. And I have not watered down these words for you because I don't want you to be scared of these words when you read Buddhist texts. It just means, is the triggering behavior out of character or are these behaviors just their nature? Is this something extra and new that they don't normally do, but today they are? Or is this something that they do all the time? This is just how they roll. Either way, no anger, let's unpack it, right? So whether it's adventitious, extra, or inherent, just how they are, either way is not a reason to have anger. Adventitiousness or inherency, then we go into direct or indirect. And direct or indirect is asking, how did the harm happen? where did it come from? Yeah, was it a direct harmful action? Like were you shot with a bullet or was it indirect? You heard something third hand or something happened from the side. In either case, anger is unjustified. And then the cause that impels the harm doer, what is it that instigated the harm exactly? Okay, so these are all kind of interesting, but when you're looking at them, you can do each one of these as like their own meditation or your own journal exercise or your own conversation with a friend. But without even worrying about the outlines, what do you think is your most common reason for holding anger? For like keeping a grudge or an old story? Yeah, go ahead. I hold grudges because I don't know how to do this. Because even if I... I'm angry, but I don't want to harm, so I'm squashing like, and suppressing. It. But how do I go from there? Now? You you Maybe hold I'll, grudges because you don't know how to deal with like the feeling. I did not talk to you for right. No. So avoidance. Ignore you. You don't exist. Yep. Yeah, yeah, a classic tale. And you're avoiding them because you're wanting to avoid the feeling, right? Or yeah. I want to avoid. A confronting it or becoming even more angry. Yeah. So which doesn't make sense. So I just avoid it. Yeah. Um, very often like I had an experience with a co-worker 
I didn't talk to her for over a year. And then one day we talked, and I didn't even remember why I didn't talk to her. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, and she couldn't remember either. <laughs> but, you know, so the clutch was there, but for a long yeah. time, I didn't even know why. But this clutch thing, I cannot get over it because I don't know what people say. You know, yeah, the grudge. What people. But that would be anger. Yeah. You know? Well, this is the question, right? The grudge is an internal experience of like hardening of heart, isn't it? Like you have a hardened heart and you want to avoid or you want to punish or you have a story. Even if the details are all faded, you just have a, I don't like you. <laughs> yeah. And I don't even want to make eye contact with you. It's uncomfortable to even meet your eyes. It's uncomfortable to even see your face. That like grudge story colors everything. You know. Yeah. And once you have it, what do you do? Right. And th the question to ask yourself is how much power are you giving to the story? Not how do you fix the person or fix the relationship that might come next. The first question is how do you find some peace? And some of what helps you find peace is to ask what was the attachment need that didn't get its needs met? Because there, there's this really interesting thing my teacher always says in his broken Tibetan, which is attachment going, anger coming, <laughs> which basically means when your attachment doesn't get what it wants, and it can't get what it wants because it's always exaggerated, then you're angry. So in, sometimes it helps to go underneath the anger and ask, what was your expectation? And remember, in Buddhism, attachment means an exaggeration. Right? It's not like attachment theory in psychology. Attachment in Buddhism means you see the good of someone or you see the good of a situation in isolation from the whole story. Or you see the good and you exaggerate its importance in the role in your own happiness. So you think, I need you for my happiness or I need you to do the thing that you do in this situation that I like. I need you to do something. Otherwise, I can't have the same amount of happiness. And part of that is an accurate assessment of their contribution. And a lot of that is way overblown, which is why things like divorces get so ugly, right? Is that if it was really love, it would just be a little bit of a disappointment when you see the whole picture of someone, right? And you're like, oh, right, yeah, no, you, your socks smell, they really do. You know, whereas when you're like in the flush of attachment and you have all the pheromones happening and all the hormones going, even the smell of their socks might not be quite as bad, right? And then the hormones kind of settle down and you're like, yeah, no, that's really bad. You got to do something about that, dude, right? Um, you know, so if it's love, you can cope with that. When it's attachment, you're enraged. Like, how dare you lie to me about your sock smell? You know, like I'm using a silly example, but you know what I mean? Like, as if they sold you a bill of goods, as if they lied to you about who they are, when they were the lovely person that you saw, but you were only looking at that, you weren't looking at the whole picture of them. So then when they showed their true colors, they were just showing the spectrum of their behaviors that they already had. They already had that whole spectrum. They weren't even necessarily hiding them. You just chose not to see. Eventually you saw and now you're mad at them. Attachment got disappointed. The spell was broken. So when we're looking at these grudges, it doesn't have to be like a romantic relationship. If you're looking at a workplace situation, it could be your expectation was they would back you up in a staff meeting when you had a good idea. The expectation would be, could be that they were gonna smile at you in the hall. It could be something really basic. But if you hadn't had the expectation, you wouldn't have set up a target to be hit. So, so a lot of letting go of the grudge is taking responsibility for your own inflated expectations. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so one pattern that I see myself is um, having the question or the attachment to this expectation that this person should eventually stop and why don't they try, right? Mm. Uh, whether they had control or they didn't, right? Uh, so I have this attachment towards that uh, they have to, you know, uh, improve and they have to revise what mm. they're doing or their pattern or whatever. And so this especially comes up in relationships where um, I am I have some dependency to the person, like the parent mm. or a romantic relationship in which you are dependent on the person. 
So that's where it gets very difficult for, because, you know, I think eventually if the person is not realizing their behavior, the cause is always there. Like you have to either leave the situation or the cause will always be there. So in these situations, I see, I can justify my anger, but, you know, I can go ahead and be angry because I'm not leaving this and this person is not um, revising their behavior. So, so I just wanted to ask that, do you mm -hmm. also think that leaving would be removing the cause and then a solution to not being angry? Yeah, it, it, these are good questions, especially when it's um, relationships where you have, like there is an, there's an agreement. It might be an unspoken agreement, but there's an agreement feeling like you're supposed to look after these things and I'm supposed to look after those things. And that's part of the agreement of the relationship. And all relationships have some sort of unspoken agreement. And the problem is, is that we usually didn't have a meeting and check that the same list, yeah, was it the same list that we both had about the agreements. And so you're waiting for them to live up to your expectation, but it's your expectation. And then it might get reinforced with, well, but all of my friends' parents do these things or all of my friends' partners do these things. So why don't you? And it's like, well, but are, is all humans identical? Do all humans have identical expectations? Of course not, you know that. But there's that part of you that feels like, I can't let it go. Yeah, I can't let it go because that's the rule, <laughs> right? That's the rule, but says who? Yeah, it says you, who has a completely unique experience of life than any other person. And, and so, you know, sometimes you do need to leave to stop watering seeds for your own suffering. You're the one watering the seeds, not their behavior. You know, that's, that's the deeper question is, how much am I enraging myself by looking for opportunities to be disappointed? And is there a way that I can start managing my own expectations so I'm not watering my own seeds anymore and I can just let them be and let them be free to be who they are? They're showing us how they love. They're showing us how they live. You can participate or not, you know? But I think that what happens with like codependency and things is that there's such an entanglement of, I need you for happiness, security, and safety. And then when there's any threat to that, there is such a rage. But this is the question for all of us is how do we feel safe and independent and loved ourselves? Yeah, whether you're a parent or a child or in a romantic relationship or a Buddhist monk or a Buddhist nun, right? And, you know, or just a traveler on the road or any kind of person, any walk of life, we all have to ask what are the ingredients for me being safe with myself, me feeling safe with my own emotions, my own responses. What are the patterns that repeat regardless of who's in front of me? I seem to make the same family wherever I go or I make the same workplace wherever I go or I keep getting into the same relationship again and again, they just have a different face each time. What is it that I'm doing that's ruining my own safety? What am I doing that's preventing my own peace? So a lot of it is just flawed logic that reinforces false expectations. And the problem with the expectations from attachment is that they happen enough often that we get that like intermittent reinforcement, you know, like Pavlov's dog. We get that intermittent reinforcement where sometimes they do do the things just like I like, which means they should be able to always do them as if, a person could always be at their best. <laughs> and then you think, yes, but I'm always at my best. I mean, except Thursdays, you know, and <laughs> after three o'clock and if I haven't eaten, <laughs> I'm at my best all the time, unless I haven't slept enough, right? You know, so it's like we're holding up people to this standard that we ourselves never live up to. But the thing is we like that version of them the best. So we keep kind of looking for it. Like that, that one day, that one day in June, you were awesome that day, be that one, do the thing that I like. <laughs> yeah, do those things. Cannot, yeah. So anyway, I mean, the, the good news is you're not alone. We all just do these things in different forms. And um, we'll do a little meditation to try and like do the deep dive into our own stuff and kind of like, 
work it through personally. So just have a little five minute stretch and just kind of let it digest and then we'll do a meditation on it. Um, so five minutes. Okay, so coming back, um, we'll do meditation. So get yourself seated in such a way that it feels stable and that you can have a straight back without um, too much effort. All right, so just get nice balance. And when you're in a chair, just make sure you're not leaned back in the chair and kind of crumpling it all. Just kind of scooch forward and get a nice straight back there. If you're on the floor, just kind of get yourself into such a way that particularly under your tailbone is supported. And if you need under your knees as well. And just take a few nice deep breaths at your own speed, letting yourself get grounded in the space. and scan through the body, allowing any areas of tension to release. Feel like you're dropping anything unnecessary that you're carrying. And move your focus to the breath for just a couple of minutes, letting the surface distractions settle. Nice, simple focus, just awareness of your breathing. And if you start to drift or sink, just gently revive your focus. Bring it back to the breath. Choosing not to follow the countless thoughts that arise. And revive your motivation by thinking, I'm going to meditate on patience, on how to overcome anger with people. 
in order to develop my mind to its fullest extent, bringing peace to myself, bringing peace to those around me, but also growing into my fullest potential, enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And by meditating on patience, I also prevent the things that create the biggest obstacles to my path. Anger ruins so much of my best motivations. May we have patience. And so we just ask ourselves in one situation in our life, maybe something recent, relatively minor, think about a time you got a bit irritated or angry at another person. even if you didn't say anything or do anything, but you felt that anger arise in your mind. Just pick one situation. And then try to be very, very specific and ask yourself, What was it that hurt you? How were you hurt? Was it the action itself? Whatever was said or done to you? Whatever happened that shouldn't? Or whatever didn't happen that should? Was the action itself the cause of your anger? Just explore. And if the answer is yes, you simply know that it's yes. And if the answer is no, it wasn't just the action. You simply know that. But then ask yourself, was it the person specifically that did the action? Is that why you were hurt? Is that what hurts you, the person, not the action? What does it feel like? Were you thinking this sort of person shouldn't behave this way? Or because of our relationship, they shouldn't behave this way? Or because of who I am, I shouldn't be treated this way? What reasons do you give yourself? And you're not looking for a right answer or a wrong answer. You're just genuinely looking into your own responses. What is it exactly hurting you?
Is it the affliction that motivated them to do the action? Was it their anger that hurt you or their jealousy or their pride? Was it their attachment that hurt you? Whatever it was that motivated the action. And just kind of sit with what feels the most prominent. Did the hurt come from the action, the person, the affliction that motivated the person to act? Does one of those feel more true than the other? Is it maybe the suffering that triggered their affliction, that motivated their action? Maybe the harm giver is the suffering underneath it all. If they weren't suffering, would they have been so afflicted? If they weren't so afflicted, would they have done the harmful thing? Is it like their suffering gave you suffering with some intervening steps in between? Or maybe was it the ignorance that propelled their past action that is ripening as they're suffering now? That ignorance, that innate ignorance that we all have. If they didn't have ignorance, they wouldn't have created actions in the past that put on karmic seeds of a negative type, but then got ripened Maybe we were a condition to water their negative seeds, a condition for them to suffer. We did not cause their suffering. We did not deserve their harm. But we might have been one of those conditions that watered an old seed of theirs. But whether that's the case or not, the whole reason that they suffer is because of their past actions motivated by ignorance and other afflictions. That deep innate ignorance that gives us the appearance of dualism, that makes us and them feel so solid, that makes me and you feel so distinct. That ignorance that makes everything seem 
just as it appears, somehow inherent or independent, even though the opposite is the case. So from their ignorance, they got suffering. From their suffering, they had an affliction. From their affliction, they did a harmful action to you. Who is to blame in all of that? What is the main cause in all of that? And maybe our suffering is from our past negative karma ripening and their bad behavior is just a condition. And sure, if they hadn't done a bad behavior, our old seeds wouldn't have gotten watered. But if we didn't have those seeds, they could do anything and it wouldn't hurt. The two things came together. Our negative karma met with their negative behavior. Both had to be there for us to suffer. So we usually think why couldn't they just behave well? Then I wouldn't suffer. But we could also think, why don't I have just purified karma? Why haven't I dealt with my negative karma? No negative karma means no suffering, regardless of how harmful people are. The Buddha's own cousin tried to kill him countless times, but he didn't suffer from it. But leaving behind karmic seeds, you can think, maybe the suffering is coming from your association with the current conditions your association with what they did because you branded it as unacceptable, it became a condition. So what if you branded that same behavior as a symptom of suffering or a symptom of an affliction or as a symptom of ignorance because all of those are true. If you hadn't labeled it, this thing harms me, but you labeled it as this person is hurting, would you hear their words differently or view their actions differently? And so let your mind just feel the truth of the fact that what hurt you was not one simple thing or one small factor. Countless things came together for the experience of harm, for your pain. And you absolutely deserve to be free from suffering and to not have pain. But the most efficient way out of your pain is to train your mind, not to try to fix them. So of all of these things that were factors in the harm, which do you have control over?
just being really logical, not about what should or shouldn't be the case, but what is actually true. What are the factors you have actual control over? We can change our relationship with the conditions in our life. We can reframe them. And we can also change our negative karma by purifying it. Can we actually help their ignorance? Only if they're open to it. Can we actually help their suffering? Sometimes, maybe. Can we change them to not have afflictions? No. We could offer them tools or conditions to train their own mind but only if they want that, only if they could hear that from us. And the action itself already happened, it's done. That karma is finished. If we respond well, we don't create more of the same. So just feel like you're bringing the power back to yourself, back to your own mind, the creator of your own happiness, the ability to overcome your own suffering right here with you. And we think through the power of these thoughts, may we develop our mind to its utmost extent by perfecting generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, and wisdom. And imagine all of that compassionate wisdom takes the form of Om Mani Peme Hum. And Om Mani Peme Hum reverberating out through space, being a catalyst for compassion for both ourself and others. And so we recite the mantra. Om Mani May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay, so you can relax your attention. And if you're having fresh insights or fresh questions, write them down and uh, we can talk about them at the top of the next week. So thanks everybody and um, have a good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you, Venera. Good night. Thank, Thank you, Venera. Good night. If you'd like to register for next week's class, 
the registration link is in the chat. Thanks, Thank Christina. you. Night, folks.